Well, good afternoon. It is a pleasure to welcome all of you for what promises to be a very special program on a truly important topic, the future of food in the Americas. We are so pleased to be collaborating on this program with the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation on Agriculture. The director of IICA, Manuel Otero, is joined today by a distinguished panel of experts. Salvador Cesar, Minister of Agriculture, Forestry, Fisheries, World Transformation, Industry and Labor in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Manuel Bravo, President and CEO of Bear Mexico and Head of Bear's Corporate uh, sorry, crop science business in North Latin American region, and Kristen Harden, CEO and president of the U.S. Dairy Export Council. On behalf of Steve Liston, who will be the moderator of the panel and is my colleague, I want to thank, on behalf of Steve and myself, I want to thank all of you for joining us here today. Director General Otero will provide keynote remarks that will set the stage for our discussion. Before I introduce the Director General, I want to give a very special thank you to my very good friend, Dr. Jorge Wertheim, Senior Advisor at IACA, whose passion for rural communities, agricultural producers, and the important role they play for all of us in the Americas has been a driving force behind today's program. Jorge, thank you for your friendship and strong support of the council. There can be no more qualified, no one more qualified than Manuel Otero to help us understand the importance of food systems and the policy discussion that is currently underway around the globe about the future management of these systems. Prior to being elected Director General of IICA in 2017, Dr. Otero held a wide range of positions at the Institute, where he started his career in 1988. He has also served as agricultural attache at the Argentine Embassy in Washington, as well as Vice President of Argentine's, Argentina's National Institute of Agricultural Technology. Since taking the helm at the IICA in 2018, Dr. Otero has made it its mission to implement innovative partnerships with a range of stakeholders, including the private sector, is which, is which is why we are so pleased to have him here today. He has been nominated by the 2021 UN Food Systems Summit as a member of the Multi-Actor Food Systems Champion Network to represent the agriculture and rural sectors of North America, Latin America, and the Caribbean. So we have with us an expert on food systems recognized at a global level who is deeply engaged in global policy maker. Dr. Otero, thank you so much for joining us. The floor is now yours and we so look forward to your comments. Dr. Otero. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Susan, for the opportunity. It is a real honor for me and the institution that I represent to be participating in this very important event of the Council of Americas. So my recognition extended to our moderator, Steve Liston, and the distinguished members of the panel. Uh, our friend, Minister Saboto Cesar, the president of uh, Bayer, Prista, as the president of the Expo Dairy Council. I have the privilege of being the director general of AICA since uh, 2018, an institution that has an historic mandate to promote progress and rural well being in the Americas with a presence in each and every one of the countries that make up uh, our hemisphere. I would like to begin my presentation. So, can you help me, please? The next one. I would like the, to emphasize that we are the most important region in the world in, term, in terms of food exports, covering a wide range of products 
from temperate and tropical zones. But it's also very important in terms of job creation. As you will see, 14% uh, of total employment comes from agriculture. And in rural areas, more than 50% is generated by agriculture. It also very important in terms of economic wealth. This figure 4.7, I would say that if we consider the inputs and also the, the aggregate value, this figure could be increased up to 30 or 40% in countries like Haiti or Paraguay. The next one. Two statistics I would like to highlight in this slide regarding the socioeconomic impact from COVID-19. 231 million people living in poverty and the number of inhabitants suffering from some type of food insecurity that has increased by almost threefold. The next one. So in, in the midst of such a deep crisis and trying to be optimistic, I would like to emphasize that the agriculture sector has been able to generate a sufficient supply of food for about 1 billion inhabitants. And at the same time, our sector had a positive performance in, ter in terms of exports in contrast with global uh, general exports that fell uh, about 9%. Once again, whereas agriculture exports grew during 2020, about 2%, total exports fell practically almost 10%. This is what resilience is all about. Agriculture sector in the Americas is a resilient sector. Next one. But nothing will be the same after the pandemic. And this is why we must lay the foundations for a new agriculture. As you will see in this slide, we need a, a climate to smart agriculture. But at the same time, we need this agriculture to be nutrition smart agriculture. So besides thinking in, in volume, we have to think in quantity. We need to provide healthy foods. At the same time, we need socially responsive agriculture, paying more and more attention to international markets and also smart value added products. This is what, why Adika emphasized about the concept of smart agriculture 4.0. This renewed vision of agriculture is not only increasing productivity, but also once again, the quality of what we produce. We will no longer be able to think about extractive agriculture. On the contrary, we have to set the basis for a sector in harmony with the environment. Far from representing a threat we are before a huge opportunity. And in this, in this regard, rural areas should be spaces for progress and wealth creation, building bridges with urban sectors. In a compressive manner, this is what uh, UN is, is organizing a meeting to discuss a uh, food system that we, from ICA point of view, consider as agri-food system. The next one. The new frontier of knowledge allows us to accelerate the transformation of our agriculture like never before. So some concepts like gene editing, precision agriculture, traceability, by economy will become boost words. And this is why we need an agriculture sector with institutions that pay a lot of attention 
to science and technology systems. Uh, the next one, please. We have in our continent something very important that other continents do not have. I am referring to water resources, 35% of total fresh water reserves in the world. We have availability of soils, practically 30%. We have biodiversity. And last but not least, we have farmers, and in many cases, we have the best entrepreneurs all over the world. So we have to be very proud of these competitive advantages that we have obviously to transform in competitive ones. The next one, please. Talking about the pending agenda, for setting the basis of uh, smart agriculture, a 4.0, we need a new generation of public policies. This public policies has to be, uh, put a lot of emphasis in long-term approach, science-based, and also with an intersectorial approach. So an agriculture sector that has the capacity to promote dialogue with the environment ministries and also with health ministers. This is smart agriculture has to be based also in public private partnership. This is so important the meeting that we are having today. This renewed vision of agriculture has to pay more attention to investment investment promotion, physical and digital ones. And once again, science and technology for increasing productivity in harmony with sustainability. Always paying attention to international trade. As I said before, we represent more than 14% of international markets. And in the medium run, this relative importance is going to be increased. And last but not least, we need to empower our family farmers uh, with more resources, with training, with services, and, pro and providing more importance to, gen to gender and youth. The next one. What is the role of ICA all about? We strongly believe that looking at the future, agriculture of the Americas will, will be a key actor in global food and nutrition security. And we are, we are also be crucial for the environmental sustainability on the, of the planet. We strongly believe in that. And, and we envision ICA as a bridge institution to build a position uh, of the agricultural sector of the Americas. Well, what does it mean being a bridge, a, a bridge institution? It means connect, connecting themes, connecting institutions, connecting public and private sector, connecting region, uh, regions, being ICA, the voice of the agriculture of the Americas. The next one. This is a very, very special year because in, in six months off, we, we are going, going to have the UN Food Systems Summit. And, and I would like to, to rephrase, we are going to have the UN Food, Agri-Food Systems Summit. Because nothing can happen if we don't pay attention, first of all, to farmers. This is why we consider in ICA farmers first. We cannot think in food without thinking before in farmers. Second uh, principle that ICA is moving ahead is science being a basic input 
for a new generation of public policy policies. And last but not least, agriculture, part of the solution and not part of the problem. Agriculture sector is an strategic sector because we can build on mitigation and adaptation policies. We have to think in, in increasing productivity, but also this sector can be a crucial sector for promoting sustainability. And before concluding, let me give you a couple of examples in, in, term, in terms of ICA being a bridge institution to promote regional public goods. The first one, we have launched uh, several months ago an hemispheric program called Living Souls in the Americas. This is Dr. Ratan Lal, World Food Prize 2020. He's a distinguished professor uh, from the Ohio State University. So we developed an alliance with the Ohio State University and other uh, national and regional institutions to curb uh, land degradation, which is, a, which is a very serious problem affecting productivity in the Americas, especially in Mesoamerica and Central America and the southern part of uh, Mexico, also in, Caribbean, in the Caribbean region. And we are ready and committed to act with Dr. Ratan Lal as our mentor and guru for in this important program. And I would like to recognize also the importance of Bayer. So I thank uh, Dr. Manuel Bravo for the support of Bayer for this endeavor. And the other example is, is another hemispheric project related with digital inclusion. Our partner in this case is Dr. Michael Kramer, Nobel Prize Economics 2019. He leads uh, an organization called, uh, called Precision Agriculture for Development. He has a great deal of experience uh, promoting a new approach for rural extension with the use of cellular phones. And we are about to launch two important projects, one in the northern part of Brazil and the other in Colombia. We think that digital inclusion is key for transforming agriculture. This is the way INICA operates we are a small institution ready to promote all type of uh, strategic alliances, especially with the private sector, with the governments, convinced that in the agricultural tra transformations lies the ground for a sustainable development in the America. I thank you once again for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh Dr. Otero, it really stands out with how both how complex these issues are and how we have to work together. We cannot afford to take these each area in isolation. Every stakeholder has to be part of this solution. And we really appreciate the attitude and the and the approach that IICA is taking to make sure that we're talking about agri-food systems, as you told it, from, from producers through to uh, consumers and the private sector. So important. We have to work together if we're going to solve these and have sustainable systems. So thank you very much for those remarks. I'm sure there are a lot of uh, follow-up questions and comments. We'll look forward to taking those during uh, after our panel. Uh, but I would like to turn now to welcome and introduce briefly our other distinguished panelists. And after I introduce all three of them, I'll ask each of them to make a few brief opening remarks. So after their remarks, uh, we're going to have a special presentation. We hope it works. We got it a little late from Dr. Kramer. Uh, he uh, has produced a video for this event. Uh, so we're gonna try to do that after the panel and then we'll do a uh, questions and answers as time permits via the chat function. You can send me a chat and I'll be happy to uh, put you in the queue for those in our um, in our uh, audience today. 
who would like to ask a question. So our first panelist today is Saboto Cesar, uh, the Minister of Agriculture, Forestry, Fisheries, Rural Transformation, Industry and Labor for St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Minister Cesar holds a Master of Laws degree from the University of London, a Bachelor of Laws degree from the University of the West Indies, and a Legal Education Certificate from the Hugh Wooding Law School. He is a lawyer, as you might have guessed, a community activist, also an advocate and politician. Uh, and among his many professional accomplishments, he has previously served as Minister of Housing, Lands and Survey, Physical Planning, Inform Informal Human Settlement and Local Government, and as Minister of Tourism and Industry. Our second panelist is Manuel Bravo, President and CEO of Bayer Mexico and Head of Bayer's Crop Science Business in the North Latin America region, which includes Mexico, Colombia, Peru, Venezuela, Ecuador, and the countries of Central America and the Caribbean. Manuel has a degree in chemical engineering from the Universidad Iberoamericana and a postgraduate degree in administration from Northwestern University Kellogg in Chicago. Mr. Bravo has dedicated most of his career to agriculture with 20 years at Bayer and Monsanto. I also want to note that Bayer Crop Science was recently announced as the first strategic partner of IECA in the Living Soils of the Americas initiative. Krista Hardin, President and CEO of the U.S. Dairy Export Council, is our third distinguished panelist today. She took on this position just a couple of months ago, following an extensive career in the agriculture area that includes positions in the private sector, on the Hill, and at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, where she served as Deputy Secretary, among other positions. Ms. Hardin received her BA in Journalism from the University of Georgia. She currently serves as Vice Chair of the National 4-H Council Board of Trustees and is a member of the Board of Directors for the Global Child Nutrition Foundation. I want to thank all three of you for being with us today, and I want to turn now to Minister Caesar for his initial remarks. Minister Caesar. Floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, Director General of ECA, other panelists, esteemed colleagues, a pleasant evening to all. It is definitely a sincere honor and a, a pleasure to, to sit to address such a critical issue of prime and first importance, definitely pivotal, not only to the political economy of Latin America and the Caribbean, but to the issues of sustenance and survival of our people. I want to lay down the basis by first of all, giving a situational analysis that there is a common denominator flowing through all of the countries of Latin America and the Caribbean in that we have a historic colonial past. And this colonial past, we were tied in production of raw material to basically be sold to countries in Europe. And it is against that backdrop that our agricultural systems were developed in plantation type economies, whereby we were the suppliers of raw material. However, over the last 100 years, we have noticed a movement towards the independence of these states and these countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. And any appreciation to have a holistic analysis as to the way forward as it pertains to food production and food productivity must explain the transition from colonial type production in agriculture to the independent and the establishment of a modern competitive indigenous production system to serve the needs of our people and our region. It brings us to today. And there are many factors which are affecting and impacting supply chains in Latin America and the Caribbean that are, are common. First of all, we have climate change, and this definitely, as the Director General noted, 
is having a grippling impact. Whilst we have the issues of climate change, it is not met head on with issues of crop insurance. So on one hand, we have the impact. On the other hand, we do not have the requisite framework for mitigation. Secondly, the issue of the purchasing of the required technology for many countries in Latin America and the Caribbean to be competitive, it's not available because of the unavailability of capital. Therefore, we are producing in Latin America and the Caribbean as a region, basically on an uneven playing field, whereby our costs of production are extremely high, and this locks us out of many global markets. Thirdly, we have not been able, and this is something that I really want to underscore and to note, until Latin America and the Caribbean are able, as countries, as subregions, to consolidate the factors of production, land, labor, and capital, to the extent that we can benefit from the economies of scope and economies of scales, individually, we will not be able to compete on global production markets, especially when we have major giants in production. For example, if Brazil wants to do soya by itself to compete globally, they will not be as the same margins of advantage as if Brazil joins together with Argentina, Chile, and Colombia to, and Mexico to have a similar basis for production. So I really want to expose that there is a critical need if Latin America and the Caribbean is to be competitive on the global market for there to be a consolidated production platform whereby factors of production, land, labor, capital, technology, and enterprise, that they are consolidated. And that is something that we are working on in the Caribbean. We have the sub-regional grouping called the Organization of the Eastern Caribbean State. We also have the CARICOM community, which basically is an initiative to advance the establishment of a single market and economy. However, we have not been able to successfully bridge the gap with the rest of Latin America. And we have seen where there are some experiments which have been exercised in the not too distant past, but we have to revisit these. I want to take the, the opportunity to thank and to congratulate the hard work of organizations such as AICA, because what it does, even though that we do not have a consolidated production platform, we have a framework whereby Latin America and the Caribbean can benefit significantly from sharing the capacity, the human resource capacity of technicians. And that is definitely a step that we are benefiting from. And I really want to thank all the technicians of ECA and other international organizations which operate on a original framework for the benefit of the member states. Issues of migration definitely affecting all our people. And with migration, we are seeing where some of our brighter minds are leaving the region as we continue to be uh, a net exporter of, of labor. And with that goes a lot of technology with them. A lot of that goes with a lot of entrepreneurship and their abilities, and it is having an impact. As it pertains to the, the issue of having effective an effective policy framework, this is definitely critical if we are to advance food systems. And what we see taking place is a disaggregation within Latin America and the Caribbean as it pertains to policy frameworks that sometimes act against each other and not working in sync for the, rec for the required synergies to be available. We must in our attempt to move forward, strengthen research development and extension systems. We must modernize and apply our digital infrastructure to applications that work for agriculture and food systems in our region. We must promote wellness and healthy eating because the issue of food sovereignty 
that is a function of our independence must also be carefully married with the issue of food safety and also food security. It is one thing for us to be self-sufficient. It is another thing for us to ensure that our populations have access to affordable food that is safe. We are seeing in our region in Latin America and the Caribbean, where many of our citizens, their health, their health are failing. And this is creating definitely a burden on the national economy. So we must also engage in risk mitigation as it pertains to the climate adaptation strategies, which must be advanced. And in short, to sum it all up, there is a, a need for, a, for further political integration and geopolitical integration within Latin America and the Caribbean so that we can have a more structured framework for production that is integrated so that we can be more competitive globally. Because if we are not competitive globally, then you would not have the sort of attraction from capital entering the agriculture sector. This is coming as an, an, an encouragement at a period where we are experiencing a pandemic and we are seeing major disruptions globally in food chains and food systems. We are also seeing where before the pandemic, there was significant pressure on the existing food supply systems globally. Therefore, we have to increase production and productivity. We have to work towards zero in hunger, reducing undernourishment for the peoples of our region. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Once again, another call for uh, for us to work together uh, from all parts of the food chain, food systems chain, producer chain, and from all parts of the region. We need to be working together. Thank you for that. Those challenging remarks uh, that we need to take all of these countries of the region, the Caribbean, especially with unique challenges uh, into account as we look at these food systems. Uh, I want to turn now to Manuel Bravo, a bear, who's going to provide uh, his initial set of remarks. Manuel. Uh, hi, Steve. Uh, uh, hi, all. Uh, and thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Susan, um, uh, Manuel, uh, for, uh, to be part to, of this uh, important event with a very clear objective, and I think the title summarizes it great how to achieve an integral, uh, integrated approach of agriculture, of our rural communities, and the food system in the Americas with all the key players. So, um, and, and I think that uh, makes even a, a more, uh, it's even more relevant uh, in a world like uh, today, uh, a new world, a post-pandemic world, with, where we are trying to implement uh, new models of working new models of trade and, and even uh, different social structure. And of course, uh, revisiting the importance of uh, sustainability in a world strongly impacted by climate change. Uh, so, so let me begin by, by explaining the broader view of uh, Bayer regarding uh, this uh, topic. So uh, I think we understand uh, that we cannot only commit to deliver innovation in the form of agriculture and health products or systems. Uh, I think right now that is not enough. This also means uh, uh, to commit to make a sustainability part of our business, part of our day-to-day -day activities. So uh, I think our journey began uh, with Bayer aligning with the comprehensive approach of the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals, right? And, and having health and, and food in our core, we choose uh, the following goals to make uh, them of our own. Number two, fight uh, hunger and, and promote health. Number five, uh, promote uh, gender equality. Number 13, reduce greenhouse gases and address climate change and number 15, to support life on Earth. So how does this mean for, for agriculture and, and uh, rural communi communities? So 
I think we understand that uh, the increasing necessity to feed a growing population around the world, but we also need urgently to do so in a sustainable manner. To comply uh, with this, I will say, apparently confronting objectives, we need to use what, what we know best, and I think uh, Manuel said right, science and technology. I think that 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 is that is key, and uh, having this challenge in mind, uh, made us develop a strategy that has three major commitments to be accomplished by 2030. The first one, to support 100 million small farmers in development countries and emerging economies to help improve local production of food supplies, and also reduce poverty in rural areas. Number two, to reduce 30% in the crop protection impact on the environment. And number three, to reduce by 30% the field greenhouse gas emitted per pound of crop produce. And of course, we include ourselves and, and we decide that we need to become climate neutral in all our operations. So, so that's a little bit of uh, the frame. Now, how can we go to, to make that happen? And, and, and I think that the first thing is that there's no magic bold bullet to reach uh, these objectives. At the end, agriculture is extremely local and different countries require different approaches and different perspectives, right? And as a consequence, we need to develop a myriad of initiatives that can get us close to those uh, goals. And, uh, and what I want to take this time is to share some examples in each bucket, but also to emphasize the importance of collaboration and strong alliances. So let me start with the first one, empowering uh, 100 million smallholder farmers. There are around 550 million smallholders farmers in the world. They own close to 700 million hectares of arable productive land. Close to 80% of that surface is in Asia, Pacific, and Africa. Of course, countries like China, India, Indonesia will be the most relevant, but close to 20 million hectares or 18 million smallholders farmers are here in Latin America, in our countries. And they already represent around 10% of the production average, right? So we have learned from our experience during the last um, many years that the most important thing for farmers to change, adopt, and maintain certain practices is the creation of additional value. Value creation for the farmer himself, but also for the value chain and everyone involved to make it uh, happen. Also, one major challenge in that transformation goes beyond products. It involves financing, machinery, infrastructure, technical assistant, commercialization, new business models, et cetera, et cetera. We really need to deeply understand the whole cycle and help them to close the loop. And as a result of this complexity, the one size fit all approach clearly does not work. We, as a team, we need to design and pilot diverse business models. We need to learn, we need to adjust. And at the end, we have to have clear that small holders need to be successful because they will, be, they, they will play a key role on the challenge of feeding an increasing population, but also because it is extremely important that the smallholders are able to improve their quality of life and the quality of life of their communities. So in this major endeavor, the use of digital tools, as uh, Manuel also referred, uh, to optimize the use of products for decision making, to make a link uh, among uh, market participants across the, the value chain objectives, it will be a key driver to accelerate this process. Uh, 
Let me share uh, one case. Uh, it's called De Casillos, and it's uh, it's being piloted in, in Mexico, in, in Honduras, in Nicaragua, in, in Costa Rica, among other countries. And the initiative are help. It's it's helping to small ranchers to learn to produce corn silage to solve the lack of pastures during the dry season. And in the past uh, uh, four years, I will say in average, those that have adopted these practices have increased profitability by three to four times by increasing the dairy productivity, but also by creating uh, value in a sustainable way. The opportunity relates to the connection among the food chain being able to increase the nutritional content of their milk at a lower cost, the possibility to access new markets that pay better for, for, for quality, and even the use of digital technology that allows them to, to have a, a better understanding of the nutrition and other key variables of, of the operation. And when you go to that initiative, it's people like uh, Nestle, Sula, Dos Pinos uh, that are being part of this uh, uh, initiative and that make it uh, much more powerful. Now moving the, to the second bullet, uh, the, to the second bucket, uh, emission reduction. As Bayer, we're working with farmers to reduce the ecological footprint of agriculture, which uh, currently accounts for about uh, 25% of the greenhouse uh, gas emissions worldwide. And uh, as, as I mentioned before, we want to help reduce those em emissions in, uh, in major agricultural markets by, by 30%. We have just launched a, a very relevant initiative uh, that have started in Brazil, the Carbon Project, in which uh, Bayer is dedicating a full team, a full squad, a new area that, uh, that recognize the value of carbon sequestration for farmers through climate smart practices as no tillage, uh, highly productive crops, uh, covered crops, or even uh, precision agriculture. It's totally a science-based project that is touching already around 300 large growers across Brazil. We're trying to prove uh, different testing methodologies and having interaction with over 80 different stakeholders as important as Embrapa. So uh, the key here is to learn and replicate in, in many other uh, countries, right? Or other initiatives like the one that uh, Manuel mentioned, the Alliance with the ICA and, and the Living Soils of uh, Americas for public policy, for outreach, and even for for development uh, of uh, new uh, and better technologies to, to put more carbon in the soil. In the term, in terms of the third bucket, the reduction of the crop protection impact in, in, on the environment, I think it is clear that um, the further reduction is possible through digital solutions, not only for precision application of crop protection, but also for new breeding technologies for integrated crop management, for risk mitigation, and even for new chemicals and biological crop protection products that will have a lower impact. So, um, so I think that that's uh, one of the key parts, but even using novel crop protection application methods like drones. Let me share uh, also here a couple of uh, examples. One is the Global Alliance against the TR4 uh, in Banano. Uh, I think this will allow the industry to limit the spread of the disease, but also will identify natural resistance and uh, general uh, and genetic solution for this uh, major problem in Banano. And that, of course, will reduce the need for crop protection. Or how to tackle Pepsicos needs to have no potato moth in their inputs for their plants. So just collaborating and working together to define the crop protection products for seedling, for a drip irrigation system, or for incorporating digital solutions with these uh, potato uh, growers that most of them are, are small. So uh, I think these three buckets are giving us a, a very uh, clear north. But uh, just to finish, allow me to, to give an example of a technology that will allow 
the change we produce corn in the world, one of the most important crops worldwide by surface or by value or by its importance. So a way to produce that, uh, a new way to produce that needs less water, that allow you to optimize crop protection usage, and that also allow you to increase its yield per hectare, I think will be uh, amazing, right? And, and, and that is why we're so excited to see this innovation brought to life uh, in Mexico, uh, launched last year and in the future uh, will be in, in the rest of the world that it's called uh, Vitala. Vitala is a system uh, with uh, three different components that uh, I, I guess, uh, I believe that will transform the way we produce corn. Uh, the system has a hybrid, a short stature hybrid, which is, of course, very attractive visually because it's uh, one meter less than the conventional plants. But more than that, this plant architecture allows basically 100% tolerance against lodging uh, caused by winds. And uh, as you may know, this is one of the key benefits for farmers with uh, uh, which uh, bring them uh, peace of mind during the whole season because uh, uh, weather it's a still a factor that they do not control and of course wind is is also that the second uh, benefit is uh, this plant architecture allows uh, for ultra high density that means that with short stature corn the farmer can, can increase their their density up to 40 percent this means efficiency because despite increasing density, there is no need to increase the amount of water nor the amount of fertilizer. And the third element of the system includes digital agricultural precision tools that brings extremely valuable information to be more precise and really take advantage of the system. So uh, this example is it's a game changing innovation solution uh, because Vitala will be offering a more sustainable future, having the potential to optimize the use of key nutrients as, as like nitrogen, but also the opportunity to reduce land uh, or to use land for other crops. And uh, the water requirement will also decrease by, by at least 30%. So the key at the end of all these uh, as I mentioned, is uh, gener generating value to the farmer and the food chain involved. So just uh, final remarks, as you notice in my comments, all the initiatives have different partners, Be we, beginning with the farmer themselves, of course, but there's no way we can achieve a true integrated view of agriculture by using only one side's vision or objectives. This is a time, a team effort, and we need everyone's vision, ideas, and support. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manuel. Uh, once again, struck by the complexity, the diversity, the need to work together if we're going to deal with all of these issues. I'm also struck by the parallel between our agricultural and climate change issues and the COVID-19 pandemic where we depend on science to bring us out to, to overcome these problems. And we also are depending on a collaboration between governments and the private sector. We've seen it work with COVID-19. It's what has to happen with food systems in the Americas and globally. So thank you very much for that. And I want to turn now to our third panelist, uh, Krista Hardin, the president of the U.S. Dairy Export Council. Uh, Krista, over to you. Thank you for the invitation and thank you to my, my um, fellow panelists. It's always a pleasure to go last because you get to hear from such um, bright and brilliant people and their remarks. And hopefully can I can amplify some of the themes that I've heard, um, we have heard over the last um, few minutes. And I think that I can only join them in a couple of um, these areas that I, I think are very important. I appreciate them hitting on that. I will thank AICA for putting this panel together. We enjoy our, our, our work with AICA and the, the partnerships that we have across the hemisphere. I think they're very important to keep having these kind of dialogues and find areas where we can agree and work together. 
I think as most folks know, the U.S. Dairy Export Council is about um, exporting dairy and dairy products across the globe. But what I like to remind people is we actually don't sell one drop or one ingredient of anything ourselves. We open doors and work with partners to make sure um, that U.S. products are available to, to citizens across the world. We sell image and reputation and value and trust, the kind of things I believe that build the, the best relationships, the best partnerships. And with us, why the, the folks on this um, this Zoom are so critical to us, to our success, and we appreciate um, the work that we can do together. We have heard a lot today talked about science-based, um, technology-based solutions that make sense for farmers. That's something we believe in very much. A big part of our membership, so the, far, the dairy farmers of the U.S. themselves, the 34,000 of them that come together to produce these fine products, we know that their voice needs to be heard in these kinds of discussions as we look ahead to what's happening and with the UN Food System Summit has been mentioned a couple of times already. We feel it's very vital to make sure that farmers' voices are, are at the table, frankly. And these type of discussions where decisions are being made that really do impact their livelihood. Um, we think it's important to make sure that um, not only does it sound good on paper, if you will, but it makes sense on the farm. I myself am the, the daughter of farmers, not dairy farmers, but peanut farmers in the southern part of the U.S. So when I call home, it's to a farmer. So I test some of these messaging about what we need to do and how we need to do it right at home. And it's also always about economics. It's about staying on the land and making sure that systems are and solutions are based on science, on evidence-based, on data that makes sense for farmers. So I just include, um, I just want to make sure we're including that in our discussions and appreciate really all the speakers today for hitting on these general things. I think it shows that all of us are thinking um, very much alike. You know, in U.S. Dairy, we, um, we like to talk about being good for people, being good for community, and good for planet. And I think those are three general themes that really define who we are. Um, as U.S. dairy, give for people obviously with a, a healthy and nutritious products that we like to share with not only domestically but internationally. Good for community, which means good for our workforce, taking care of our own families, caring about the communities where we're located, whether that's um, in a, a rural area or a suburban area, wherever it might be, or where our products are being exported to. But also good for planet, and I think you're hearing more and more about sustainability. I'm producing um, our products in a sustainable way. The U.S. industry set goals last March, right in the beginning of COVID, when it would have been a very good and easy time, I think, for our industry to say, hey, we're going to put this off. We're going to look at our goals later. Instead, the industry came together and set ambitious goals because we don't have all the answers. Yes, there's a long runway in some cases, but because the answers aren't there. We need new technology. We need science. We need to be doing this work. But being carbon neutral by 2050, um, some say, oh, that's a long time away. Well, if you're a farmer and it's on your land, maybe it's not. Maybe because you don't have all those answers, it's going to take a little bit longer. If I was a betting person, which I am not, but if I was, I'd say we'll get there a lot sooner. But what it says to me, and I hope it says to this audience and to our partners around the globe, we are serious about our environmental footprint. We're serious about being good for a planet. We also talk about water use and how we can use it more wisely and also nutrient management. We understand soil health and the importance of how these come together to make sure we are a good citizen. We're taking care of of our natural resources wisely and making good decisions. So I think that's what you'll see from the U.S. Um, is we start looking about um, sustainable nutrition as a, as a phrase that we use quite a bit, making sure that, that folks understand we know as a U.S. industry, it's not one or the other. We have very good, healthy, nutritious products, but they also need to make sure they're good for planet. So that's the kind of things we work for. So I think it takes um, all of us coming together. I really appreciate the kind of 
um, fellowship and relationships that we build in these types of um, opportunities to really talk about what's good for the Americas, how we can work together, making sure that our farmers stay on the land and continue to produce these great food. So I'll hush there. I know folks have been uh, having to listen for a long time. I think it's good to be able to get to some questions and more dialogue instead of another long speech, but I do appreciate being part of this panel. So thank you, Steve. Thank you so much, Krista. We really appreciate your participation. And again, this just call for collaboration among all the stakeholders. It's going to be important if we're going to uh, figure out how to approach food systems in a sustainable, healthy way uh, that, that values producers, farmers, consumers, all the stakeholders and the private sector wants to be part of that solution. So that's, that's great. Thank you for that message. Before we get to questions, I want to do two things. Uh, Dr. Otero mentioned two partners. One of them is with us uh, on the line, Dr. Ratan Lal. We're so pleased that he has joined us as a, just to listen to this program. I think that just tells you uh, how significant our panelists and, and IICA's work is. Thank you, Dr. Lal, for being with us today. We are, we also have a presentation from the other panelist, and we're going to share that. It uh, from not from the other panelists, from the other um, partner that Dr. Otero mentioned, who Michael Kramer, 2019 Nobel Laureate in uh, Economic Sciences, uh, and so we're going to share that now. And I, while we're pulling that up, we got it late, so we're we're hoping it works well. Uh, we're going to give it a try because we want everybody to hear it. Uh, and let me just tell, for those of you who don't know, Dr. Kramer is a professor of economics at the University of Chicago, uh, recognized for his work on innovative ways to address one of humanity's most urgent issues, the reduction of global poverty. Dr. Kramer earned his PhD in economics from Harvard University, was previously a member of the faculty at MIT and Harvard. In addition to the Nobel Prize, Dr. Kramer has won awards for his work on health economics, agricultural economics, and on Latin America. Uh, although he could not be with us today in person, he was kind enough to record this brief okay. message, which we will hear now. Thank you, Dr. Otero, for the presentation, and thank you to ICA and the Council of the Americas for the opportunity to speak. I'm sorry I couldn't attend the meeting in full. As Dr. Otero mentioned, we're in the midst of an unprecedented social and economic crisis. Historically, crises have spurred technological change and sometimes led to the adoption of new systems with long-lasting effects. We now regularly hold meetings and conferences over Zoom. Maybe that will affect how we do things in the future. Similar changes could happen in agriculture. For example, it may be valuable to adopt digital approaches to deliver services such as agricultural extension. Governments and international institutions are moving in that direction now, which raises the question of whether digital extension could be useful beyond the current pandemic. There are currently over 1 million agricultural extension workers worldwide. However, there's limited evidence on the impact and cost effectiveness of current in-person agricultural extension systems. They sometimes face expense and accountability issues, and information flows mostly one way, from workers to farmers. Digital technology could augment and improve existing extension services. First, mobile phone-based information delivery has the potential to be highly cost-effective. Mobile penetration rates are already high and rising in Latin, American, in Latin America, as they are in many low- and middle-income countries, and text and calling rates are extremely inexpensive. Information delivered through mobile phones can be made available on demand, can be customized to individual farmers' needs, and even time to the crop calendar. Extension services can be tested and made more effective through iteration, A-B testing, and data analysis. There are reasonable grounds for skepticism about strong claims on the impact of digital agricultural extension. Maybe farmers do not need more information or will not change their practices in response to it. Perhaps there are other barriers. However, initial studies have found statistically significant positive effects of digital agricultural services. 
Randomized trials in several African countries have found evidence that very basic text messages can improve input use, crop yields, supply chains, and have market level impacts. In one experiment, simple text messages increase the odds of farmers adopting Lyme by 22%, with an implied benefit cost ratio of nine to one. Meta-analyses combining several different studies show that basic messages significantly increase adoption of fertilizer and nutritious, nutritious crops, and the digital extension increases crop yields by about 4% on average. One extension program that provided output price information to fishermen reduced consumer prices by 40 by 4% and fishermen's profits, sorry, and increased fishermen's profits by 8%, improving overall market efficiency by reducing waste. While the effects of digital extension are modest in absolute magnitude, they provide a large relative boost above other existing promotion efforts. And again, they're extremely low cost, which means that even modest effects may make them highly cost effective. There are also indirect effects of digital extension programs, such as improved input use and yields among farmers that live close to or interact with those that receive services. This occurs through information spillovers. So although digital agricultural extensions are already very cost effective, I believe there'll be many opportunities for further innovation and improvement of digital extension services in the future, especially as smartphone penetration increases and other advances in technology become more widely available. Advances in remote sensing can en enable even more customized information. Machine learning and artificial intelligence could improve personalization and digital technologies could be integrated into existing agri-dealer and in-person extension systems. For example, accurate local weather forecasting could be valuable for farmers, for example, for decisions about when to plant or harvest based on when the rainy season is starting or, or ending. Accurate local weather forecasts are not available uh, everywhere, but they could be made available for a reasonably small fixed cost. That could easily be integrated with digital extension with location data enabling customized weather forecasts. Two-way communication also creates the possibility for collecting data from farmers. Useful information such as seed variety, plot location, and pest and disease incidents can be crowdsourced from farmers. The data can then be leveraged to provide them with more customized advice and to generate stronger recommendations using big data. Crowdsourcing could also be applied to citizen science efforts. While agricultural trials are now overwhelmingly conducted by scientists on agricultural experimentation stations, mobile phones could enable complementary and more localized learning via trials among farmers. In the future, we could crowdsource field trials, use remote sensing and smartphone images to track yields, and then disseminate learning to farmers at large. Pilots, of course, are needed to test whether we can use crowdsourced information to formulate field validated and contextually appropriate agronomic recommendations and test the effects of those recommendations on yields. More immediately, more trials and A-B tests are needed to improve intervention design, tweak system and message designs, and compare service usage. Large technology companies use this kind of A-B testing on a regular basis to improve their services. And extension services would benefit from applying these same techniques. It's worth noting that evidence on what kinds of services work best is a global public good. Findings from one setting could inform design and experimentation in other locations. One source of research on digital agriculture is Precision Development, an NGO that I helped found. Precision Development has signed an MOU with ICA to bring digital advisory services to smallholder farmers in Latin America. Precision Development reduces information poverty by providing actionable, customized information through mobile phones and is currently reaching 3.8 million farmers across nine countries in Africa and Asia and is starting operations in Latin America in 2021. 
The model of precision development is to provide customized agricultural recommendations to farmers on their phones using information collected from farmers and agricultural information widely available to generate customized content that covers from pre-sowing to post-harvest management. Precision development focuses on encouraging farmers to adopt practices that improve their yields and profits, as well as environmental sustainability. The model relies on the use of behavioral sciences to design messages and services, and the use of experiments to test, iterate, and improve the services. Precision development is scaling rapidly through partnerships with governments, NGOs, and private firms. The increase in scale is associated with reduction of marginal costs and a reduction of the average cost per farmer. At the end of 2020, precision development services cost about $1.38 US dollars uh, per farmer per year. These services scale rapidly through partnerships with governments, NGOs, and private firms. We're in advanced discussions with ICA and the ministries of agriculture in Brazil and Colombia to complement their in-person extension services with digital tools. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak on this important topic. I'm excited to observe ECO's work on this area in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, we're so uh, pleased that Dr. Kramer uh, provided us that, um, uh, that video, uh, which added a whole another dimension to our discussion today. I'd like now to turn to questions and answers. We've got about 20 minutes, uh, and I would like to encourage you, if you would like to ask a question, we're going to do so via the chat function. You can send me a chat, uh, and I will be happy to ask your question for you. Uh, if you want to be identified, please let me know uh, your uh, name and affiliation so that uh, we can recognize you for that as well. Uh, so let me kick us off. I, I, every single one of you has mentioned, including Dr. Kramer, has mentioned the role of technology. We're in the middle of another technological revolution, a digital revolution now. And so I, I would like, uh, just to starting with Dr. Otero, I would like uh, to know as we head towards this, the Food Systems Summit, as we head towards a summit of the Americas in 2022, what are the technology and digital technology issues that ought to be top of mind? What are you seeing and where do you think uh, leaders should put their focus? What stands out to you? And I'm gonna ask each one of our panelists to comment, what stands out to you as the most important elements of this that we can all be working together to highlight and to ensure that all along the chain, we have access to these technologies and particularly small uh, farmers, rural communities. Let me start with you, Dr. Otero, and ask if you would like to um, comment on that. Thank you, Steve. Let me first of all recognize the presence of Dr. Ratan Lal and express once again my recognition for, for the possibility of, of joining efforts in curving uh, land degradation. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Lal. Let me let me try to answer your question first of all on a general basis, uh, saying that Latin American and Caribbean countries are not investing enough in science and technology. Whereas uh, developed countries are investing more than $3 per $100 produced in Latin America and Caribbean countries, we're investing probably $1 or less. So the general message is we have to invest more. We need the collaboration of private sector. And thirdly, we, we should have to make some adjustment in the science and technology agenda, putting more emphasis in this new alliance between productivity and sustainability. Having said that, let me underscore the, the importance of, of uh, digital technology. As, as Dr. Kramer said, emphasizing that cellular phones are the most important tools for applying good practices, for preventing health problems, 
for connecting with urban se sectors. So we are ready to launch projects, as Dr. Kramer said, in, in Brazil, in Colombia, hopefully in the Caribbean countries, because uh, we are offering uh, the possibility of applying some, promoting some applications for promoting uh, a new tools for agriculture extension. So cellular phone, cellular phone is a very important tool that we need to, to spread more because this is key for uh, rural modernization. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Otero. Minister Caesar, would you like to comment on what you see in the technological realm that needs to be at the top of our agenda? Yes, um, first of all, there has to be an issue addressed about the capitalization of technology. How do you actually purchase it? It's all well and good to do the research and to know what new forms of technology can be used to advance production and productivity. But at the end of the day, a dollar value has to be placed to it and someone has to pick up the cost. The cost can either be borne by the state or the cost can be borne by the private sector. And what I think is going to take place with all the hard work, for example, that organizations that uh, like ECA has done, that brings the information to the people in terms of getting the actual hardware in your hands, there is going to be a critical role for joint ventures between indigenous companies within Latin America and the Caribbean, working in tandem with foreign direct investment, which will be aligned with multinational organizations. So I see that as a, a, a pathway whereby we can have a critical transfer of technology to our region. And, and this is a natural call for many of the companies that we have in our region, in Latin America and the Caribbean, not to shy away and await on purely foreign direct investment to bring the technology. But we appreciate that if we harness the opportunities that are available by purchasing the hardware, the cutting edge technology that is available, both the state joining with the private sector from within that it can actually bring greater benefits. Uh, thank, thank you, you. Minister. And, and we have a related question. I just want to throw it in here. And Minister, if you want to address it, uh, you can continue for a moment, but it's from Angela Bastidas, which is about rural, how we bring these technologies more quickly, especially to rural communities. Many of them don't even have the bandwidth they need to be able to access their cell phones. So how do we, you know, how do we make sure, uh, what can we do? What do you see? And Minister, again, I, I throw that out. If you'd like to respond in terms of accelerating the ability of rural communities to access uh, these technologies. Yes, I, I just want to underscore a very important point. As we move away from the plantation type economy, and uh, the, the monocrop type of production, what we saw in many countries in Latin America and the Caribbean is broad-based diversification, whereby you have family farmers producing on very small scales. Now, if you are to bring cutting edge technology, you have to first have an aggregation of small farmers on a platform so that they can utilize the technology which is available. You, you, you cannot take, it's not, it's not gonna work if you take a multi-million dollar piece of hardware to a, a, a husband and a wife who, who are farming in, in under the Lasso Frame Mountains and St. Vincent and Grenadines. So what we have been able to do in some countries in Latin America and the Caribbean successfully is to advance the establishment of major cooperatives. And these cooperatives have been bolstered a lot by, by the state in some instances. And this aggregation of factors of production of small family farmers, then I can see the technology getting to them in a meaningful way and being utilized by them to advance the cause of production and productivity. Thank, thank you, Minister. It's such an important point uh, 
to to bring into the discussion. Uh, I want to turn now to Krista Harden and ask if you'd like to comment on these digital and technological transformation issues, how we can make sure that they're top of mind and what should be top of mind for policy. Well, I, thank, thank you, and I, and I agree with, with what's been said. I think every farmer wants the latest technologies. They want science. It doesn't matter how small you are, how large you are. You know, it's about productivity, it's about efficiencies, about being able to be impactful on your operation. And sometimes it's very basic technology um, as Dr. Otero said, just your cell phone, and that can be difficult. So broadband access to the basis is also important. In dairy, even some of the smallest dairies need robots. They use digesters. They may use drones. Um, measured irrigation or water um, management is also very important for even the smallest uh, farmers. But also you can get more sophisticated in talking about gene editing. Um, and I'm sure that might be mentioned by one of our panelists and looking at other seed production for feed, in our cases for animal, for protein. So it, it really is about efficiencies. I think that's what technology does and productivity. It can be involved all aspects um, of, um, of a farm, no matter the size. Um, it can be certainly hopefully addressed for even the smallest of our farmers. So, so important. Yeah, a lot of these are available at all levels, so large to small farmers. It doesn't. These are not only available, especially today. And Dr. Kramer mentioned the digital extension services, which are bringing all of this even further in. So thank you for that, Krista. Let me turn to Manuel Bravo now, if you'd like to. You shared a number of examples, but are there more that, that come to mind as policymakers look at how to um, really make food systems work for all stakeholders? Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, and uh, I, I would uh, I agree with uh, uh, what it has been uh, said about uh, digitalization. I, I think it's a it's a very powerful uh, tool that we're starting to have in our hands to to accelerate uh, the the this uh, process with uh, small holders. Uh, but I, I will say that there are uh, uh, different stages in in the process. So. Uh, First, we we really need to start doing much more digitalization of the of the process of the business, right? Uh, and not only from the side of uh, of knowing the farmers, understanding their needs, um, because in that way we can uh, aggregate the data and and really look for the most impactful uh, solutions, but also digitalization of the of, of the business or of the functions because that will allow us to accelerate solutions in, in research and development, will allow us to make a traceability of the produce, to really know what is demanded in the, in the market and avoid losses. And uh, very importantly, and I think it, it has been mentioned uh, several times, uh, how can we use this uh, uh, digital transformation on uh, knowledge transfer? So, so here the the most uh, relevant thing it's uh, it's the the speed and the efficiency that you can achieve with uh, with this. So, uh, digitalization is is the first part. Once you uh, are able to do that, that it's not simple, but then you can really transform your function. You can really transform the business and and make it uh, uh, much more powerful. So, so. I think it's it's a process. Uh, we're in the in in, in the beginning of the, of that process, but I'm I'm sure that uh, if we have this conversation in uh, three four year time, it's going to be totally totally different um, in terms of uh, of uh, adoption of uh, technology, uh, how uh, the speed of uh, new uh, solutions for the farmers uh, and even. Uh, traceability of, uh, of what it's being done, not only from farmers, but even for, for from points of sale, right? Where is bought, what is bought, when is bought, uh, that will give us a, a great possibility to even reduce cost of inputs for the farmers. Thank you, uh, Manuel. I, I wanna stay with this theme of digitalization for a minute uh, and turn to Dr. Otero again and ask about, uh, I have a question from Christian Gomez of Walmart, and uh, it's about 
the role of digitalization in, in government processes and in establishing and maintaining rule of law, which as we all know, for the private sector, that's just critical to, to know that you can work with the government, that there's rule of law as you invest. Dr. Otero, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about from the food systems and agriculture position about the rule of law issues, about how digitalization may be changing, how governments operate and how they ensure that investors, that farmers, that producers, that everyone in the food system is able to really uh, benefit from these systems and to enjoy rule of law. Thank you, Steve. Uh, let, me, let me elaborate the answer emphasizing that digitalization should have to, to consider digital public goods. We need a, a framework of long-term policies uh, trying to promote physical connectivity. The sad truth is that probably half of our farmers in rural areas in Latin America and the Caribbean countries are not connected. Uh, thirdly, we should have to train farmers. We, we consider that is is very uh, uh, the necessity to promote training once again to farmers to take advantage, advantage of all these uh, possibilities. Once again, we need strong alliances between uh, public, private sector, and ICA obviously accompany all, all this uh, path. Thank you. Okay, I have about uh, 10 questions and the time for about one more, I think, that I, I wanna give everybody. So I apologize in advance to all of you uh, who don't get your questions answered, but let me stay with you for a minute, Dr. Otero. And what I really wanna do, we have a private sector audience uh, to a great extent here. And, and the reason we're doing this program is that we want to have that collaboration. And so I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Otero and, and then turn to our other panelists, as you consider the private sector and particularly public private partnerships, what needs to be, how do we break down the barriers? How do we create more trust? There's historically been a lack of trust, particularly from many rural communities, often with good reason. Uh, but how do we break that down today? We've heard the important role the private sector is playing. What what do we need to do as companies, as private sector? What does EICA need to do? What do governments need to do? How do we how do we solve this so that we're actually working together? First of all, let me let me define that during my administration, I always repeat that ICA is an open door institution. ICA, ICA belongs to the governments, but at the same time, ICA is conscious that in many countries, in many cases, the private sector is the owner of the cows. They are the ones do are, that are doing risks for uh, for transforming. Uh, 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 foods. So we need we need a new alliance between public and private sector. We are, for example, uh, a very important alliance with Bayer. As I said before, working uh, with the living soil programs, but, but also with Microsoft, with uh, an interpretive center for the future of agriculture. So we open the door. For, for being the bridge between public and private sector. The only way to transform agriculture and returning a progress and prosperity to the rural areas. I fully agree with Krista. We need uh, rural areas in which a progress, a job creation, a breaking down the vicious circle, because I am a little bit tired are always thinking in Latin America and Caribbean countries that rural areas are synonymous, for example, of poverty, exclusion, and migration. We need to transform the reality, and private sector is essential for this renewed vision of agriculture. ICA is totally committed to, to being once again the bridge between public and private. Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, Dr. Otero. Let me turn to the minister with this question about how, how we can break down these barriers, um, particularly what the private sector needs to do. And I've been asked just to throw in there about um, it, at whether it's possible to accelerate the digital skills of, of the rural population. I know we've addressed that a little bit, but if you have more on that, in the Caribbean in particular, uh, obviously we know the Caribbean faces some unique challenges. But uh, I'm really interested in how the private sector governments can work together. Your view, uh, Mr. Minister. Yes, well, the state is there to set the policy framework and to always create the enabling environment. And uh, this has to be clearly defined. It has to be clearly demarcated. And the lines of communication must be clearly open. So you have the Ministry of Agriculture that manages this policy. You have the hardworking institution, for example, like AICA, which will give that international support to aggregate cutting edge technology and place into position assistance to work along with the national framework. Of course, as the, the DG noted, the policymakers must always ensure that where policy is being directed is relevant to capital. So you may have a policy as a government, but the people in the private sector, they don't see it as a feasible or viable opportunity. And it is in circumstances like these, you can have a breakdown in trust. You could also have a breakdown in trust, for example, where there is the repurposing of finance, which hitherto was placed for agriculture and had to be diverted. And sometimes persons don't appreciate the vicissitudes which will impact on the arrangements in a budget. But what I can conclude on, on this issue is that there is a need for openness and transparency in the conversation. The state must not assume that they are the be all and end all of the creation of policy. Where there is no consultation, there is a breakdown of trust. And the state must ensure that in every policy, it begins with a clearly articulated process and program for consultation with stakeholders and build from there. Once you have that sort of developmental framework in place, then the right um, and enabling environment will be established. Thank you, Mr. Thank Minister. You. I think I heard our uh, members all cheering as you were speaking there. Uh, consultation with governments is what they love to hear and what they love to have and with uh, organizations like ICA. I'm gonna give the private sector the last word here uh, for our conversation. I'm gonna turn once again to Krista Harden if you'd like to comment on how we can break down these barriers, work together. Well, you know, I, I was um, taught um, as a young farm girl that you earn trust and you earn trust by being trustworthy. So I think transparency that has been mission, mentioned, accountability by all partners is what farmers are looking for. They want practical solutions that make sense for their operation, for their family. They want it to be able to attract the next generation back to that family business. And these partnerships are the only way it's gonna be feasible um, to be able to grow um, agriculture and have our young people see it as a livelihood where they can actually make a living, where they can feed their families and hopefully others. So again, it's very simple. You have to be trustworthy. And that's what we we're really, the good news will travel um, if we are all trustworthy in these relationships and partnerships. Absolutely, and that's one of the reasons the council is so pleased to do this. We wanna build that trust. We wanna be a partner in building that trust for all of these stakeholders. Um, so please, thank you for that, Krista. Let me turn to Manuel Bravo. You get the last word, Manuel. Oh, thank you. Um, I will say that uh, in order to turn down barriers, I, I will uh, steal some words from, from Manuel. And uh, I will say we have all of us to put the farmer first. That's it. If we think uh, any solution will make them more profitable, more productive, or more sustainable, we are in the right way. And 
if and only if the farmer is successful is that we all gonna be successful. So as last word, uh, I think farmer first will be a, a, a good slogan. I think we can all agree with that. Uh, if we're talking food systems, we have to talk farmers. We have to talk to them first uh, and and then move on from there. So I want to thank all of you for being with us today. I want to thank especially Dr. Otero uh, and Ika, um, Dr. Wertheim for, for working with us to set this up. This is the beginning of a collaboration with the Council of the Americas. I want to thank uh, Krista Hardin. I want to thank Manuel Bravo. I want to thank Minister Caesar for being with us today. Uh, it really is a significant conversation and contribution, and we're going to be continuing this dialogue. Thanks to all of you who joined us today with the council. We had a great participation. This is a recorded session, uh, so it will be up on our website in very short order, and uh, it will be available for uh, viewing, and we hope many of you will point others in this direction so that we can get the word out on the need for stakeholder collaboration through the value chain. Farmers first. We love it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day and a great week.